This module discusses Hawaii's native butterflies, how to recognize them, and how to grow the plants that they rely on. I'm Will Haynes, and I work with the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Forestry and Wildlife. My work focuses on the conservation of native insects through ha habitat enhancement, captive rearing, and reintroduction. By the end of this module, you should be familiar with Hawaii's two native butterfly species and their host plants, be able to distinguish between our native butterfly species and the most common non-native lookalikes, understand some of the threats faced by our native butterfly species, and learn how to cultivate butterfly host plants and create potential habitat. Butterflies and moths belong to the insect order Lepidoptera, which roughly translates as scaly wings. This refers to the tiny shingle-like scales which cover the wings and give them their color and patterns. Lepidoptera is the second most diverse order of insects behind the beetles, containing about 180,000 species worldwide. Of these, about 90% are moths and the other 10% are butterflies. The larvae of most Lepidoptera are herbivorous, feeding on leaves or other plant tissues. Adult butterflies and moths feed exclusively on liquids since their mouthparts are modified into a straw-like proboscis. In most cases, their liquid diet consists of flower nectar, although many species also feed on sap or fermenting fruit. Some moths don't feed at all as adults and don't even have mouthparts. These species live only long enough to mate and lay eggs. Since most moths and butterflies visit flowers, they are important pollinators. By looking at a flower's characteristics, we can sometimes make a good guess about what sort of animal is likely to pollinate it, be it a bird, bat, or insect. Generally speaking, flowers pollinated by nocturnal moths tend to be white with a tubular corolla and fragrant at night. Night blooming jasmine is a good example of a moth pollinated plant. Flowers pollinated by butterflies, on the other hand, tend to be relatively large, conspicuous, and colorful since butterflies are active in the daytime and use visual cues to locate flowers. Hawaii has a pretty high diversity of native Lepidoptera. We have about a thousand species of Lepidoptera that are native to Hawaii, and this is roughly one fifth of all of our native insects, which total about 5,000. Virtually all of these native species are endemic, meaning they are found only in Hawaii and nowhere else in the world. In addition to these native species, we have about 200 species of non-native moths and butterflies. Most of these were accidentally introduced to Hawaii and many of them are pests. About 30 species have been purposefully introduced for biological control of weeds such as lantana. Looking at these numbers, you might think at first that our Lepidoptera are doing pretty well since the number of native species outnumbers the, the non-native species. But in reality, most of our native Lepidoptera are confined to high elevation native forests, and many of them are very rare or even extinct. Unfortunately, near, nearly all of the insects you encounter in residential areas are gonna be non-native. And these non-native species have also invaded the native forests. So in terms of the actual number of insects in terms of abundance, our native species tend to be outnumbered by the non-native species. Although we have about a thousand species of native Lepidoptera in Hawaii, only two of these are butterflies. Compared to continental ecosystems, butterflies are, butterflies are underrepresented in Hawaii. Worldwide, butterflies account for about 10% of Lepidoptera species, but in Hawaii, butterflies account for only 0.2% of the native Lepidoptera. One hypothesis to explain this is that butterflies tend to be very host-specific, with their caterpillars only being able to feed on a few types of plants. This is in contrast to many moths, which might be more generalist in their behavior. They might be able to feed on many different types of plants, or um, many of them are even detritivores or scavengers. So although butterflies are strong flyers, and they might have been able to disperse to Hawaii just as well as moths could, if their host plants were not already here, 
they wouldn't have been able to establish as well. So the two species that we do have in Hawaii, the two native species, are the Kamehameha butterfly, or Vanessa Tamehameha, and the Hawaiian blue, or Udara blackburni. This presentation will talk about both species. The Hawaiian word for, for butterflies, generally, is pulelehua. The Kamehameha butterfly is also referred to as lepelepe ohina, uh, whereas a specific Hawaiian name for the Hawaiian blue is not known. The Kamehameha butterfly is the larger of our two native butterflies. It belongs to the family Nymphalidae, which are called the brush-footed butterflies. In these butterflies, the first pair of legs are reduced and are not used for walking. So if you look at that photo on the left side of the slide, it looks like the butterfly only has two pairs of legs because that first pair is really reduced. The butterfly's wings are bright orange and black on the upper side and a mottled brown or gray on the underside. So they're more camouflaged when they have their wings folded up. The species is sexually dimorphic, which means that the males and females are slightly different in color. If you look at the black area towards the tips of the forewings, in the male, some of the spots are orange, whereas in the female, all of those spots are white. The Kamehameha butterfly is found on all of the main Hawaiian islands, or most of the, the main Hawaiian islands, um, primarily in the wetter parts of the islands. Um, it's been designated as the state insect, but most of our residents have never seen it. Um, this is because its populations have really declined over the years, and it's been extirpated from many of the areas where it used to be common. On most islands, it's restricted to upper elevations and deep valleys where its native host plants still thrive. The precise reasons for its decline are still unclear, but um, Introduced predators such as ants and birds um, are probably an important factors in these declines. The Kamehameha butterfly is a host plant specialist and its caterpillars can feed only on endemic plants in the nettle family or the family Urticaceae. In Hawaii, there are five genera of trees and shrubs in this family and the Kamehameha butterfly can utilize all five of these. In this presentation, we'll focus on mamaki, which is the most common host plant, and it's definitely the easiest to propagate. Um, but if you're interested in propagating any of these other species, um, there are resources out there that you can find to, uh, to propagate those. I'll run through the life cycle of the Kamehameha butterfly. Since we've worked a lot with this species, we've figured out how to rear it in captivity, and we know a lot more about its biology than we know about the Hawaiian blue. Kamehameha butterflies will lay their eggs singly on the leaves of their host plants, and these can be either on the top or the bottom surface of the leaf. The eggs themselves are roughly spherical and about the size of a poppy seed. The eggs take about a week to hatch, and the egg in this photo is about to hatch, and you can actually see the fully formed caterpillar inside. At the top of the egg, you can see the dark head of the caterpillar, and at, on the side of the egg, you can see the hairs that cover its body. The caterpillars of Kamehameha butterflies build shelters to protect themselves from predators and parasitoids. So the first thing a caterpillar does after it hatches is to cut a semicircular arc into the edge of the, le of the leaf. Um, this creates a flap, which the caterpillar then folds over itself and affixes to the underside of the leaf with silk. The other thing it does is because our native nettles produce a clear latex as a defense against her herbivory, um, to combat this, this latex, caterpillars will trench the veins of the leaf to cut off the supply of latex to the part of the leaf that they're feeding on. So in this photo, you can see the, the small brown nicks on the leaf um, that are on the, the leaf veins. So the combination of, of the shelters and the leaf trenching 
uh, create such a distinctive type of feeding damage that we can actually use the feeding damage to identify this species, even if the caterpillar is no longer present. So this is very useful for surveying for the Kamehameha butterfly, so, because if we find the, um, the shelters, we know that the Kamehameha butterfly is in the area um, and that it's utilizing those host plants. The caterpillars continue to eat and grow, and they'll make several shelters during their lifetime. As they grow, they molt several times. The, the developmental stage in between molts is called an instar. So when a caterpillar first hatches from the egg, it's considered, it, it's considered the first instar. And then when it molts for the first time, it transitions into the second instar. So the caterpillars continue to molt and go through these instars, and they go through five instars before they eventually pupate. Up until the fifth instar, the caterpillars are basically dark in color, but when they reach that fifth instar, they change drastically. Fifth instar caterpillars are typically pale green and covered with white-tipped orange and black spines. The caterpillar's head is also covered with spines. Some Kamehameha butterfly populations also have a reddish-brown or purple morph, though the green morph that's pictured here is the most common. The entire larval stage lasts about 30 days. At the end of the fifth instar, the caterpillar hangs upside down and molts one final time. Underneath the last caterpillar skin is the skin of the chrysalis, which is soft to start out but in a matter of hours hardens up into a hard chrysalis. The butterfly emerges after about 12 days in the chrysalis, so the entire life cycle from egg to adult takes about 45 days. Although Kamehameha butterflies do visit flowers to feed on nectar, they will also feed on the fermenting sap of trees. They're attracted to the odor of the fermenting sap, which kind of smells like beer, and they sometimes will congregate on these sap flows um, on koa and also other trees. They aren't necessarily restricted to native tree species. For instance, the butterfly in this photo is feeding on the sap of a non-native sugi pine tree. Once they reach adulthood, Kamehameha butterflies can live anywhere from a couple of weeks to maybe one or two months. Um, courtship and mating in this species occurs right around sunset, so when the sun starts going down, the butterflies will get kind of frisky and start chasing each other around, um, doing sort of courtship dances. Once they're, they're mated, a single female can lay hundreds of eggs during her lifetime. And like most Hawaiian insects, Kamehameha butterflies aren't strongly seasonal, um, although their numbers may go up and down throughout the year. Um, there's not a clear uh, seasonality to it. They have many overlapping generations per year. So at any time of year, if you go out into the field, you might find eggs, caterpillars, and adults at the same time. Now we're going to talk about how to identify the Kamehameha butterfly compared to some of our non-native butterflies. Although Hawaii is home to only two native species of butterfly, at least 16 non-native species of butterfly have established in the islands. Um, several of these species are predominantly orange and black, and so they might be easily mistaken for the Kamehameha butterfly if you don't know what to look for. So what I'm going to do is go over each of these non-native lookalikes and point out how they can be distinguished from the Kamehameha butterfly. So the first of these lookalikes is the monarch butterfly, which is probably one that most people are familiar with. The, the monarch butterfly is probably the, the most well-known butterfly in the world, and it's been established in Hawaii for quite a long time. Um, it's been established since milkweeds were introduced in the mid-1800s. Although it's larger than the Kamehameha butterfly and it's quite distinct, uh, the two species will still sometimes be confused. Um, the monarch butterfly, however, has a much bolder striped pattern on both the upper and lower sides of the wings. 
its flight pattern is also different. So the monarch tends to soar and glide without flapping its wings very much, while the Kamehameha butterfly is a really fast flyer, um, beating its wings really rapidly as it kind of zooms around from plant to plant. So although the, the monarch butterfly has faced declines in its native range, which is North America, um, it's not native in Hawaii. And so it, although it's not thought to pose any direct threats to native species, um, you should keep in mind that many of its mil milkweed host plants are in fact invasive in Hawaii. So if you're um, trying to attract this butterfly to your garden, just be really careful what sort of plants you, you plant. Something that's appropriate to plant on the mainland uh, may not be appropriate to, to plant in Hawaii. The second lookalike species that I'll talk about is the Gulf fritillary butterfly. So this, this butterfly is very commonly mistaken for the Kamehameha butterfly, even though its, its color patterns are quite different. Um, I think many residents have grown up being taught that this butterfly is actually the Kamehameha butterfly. So um, the Gulf fritillary is about the same size as the Kamehameha butterfly, and it has a similar flight, flight pattern. Um, and it's also often found in uh, the same types of habitats that the Kamehameha butterfly is found. So you will see this butterfly in native forests often. Um, but, you know, it has a lot more orange on the forewings and not very much black. And then if you look on the, the underside of the wings, um, it is very distinctive with these bright white spots. The, the caterpillars of this species feed on plants in the passion flower family. And they are um, a red, red caterpillar with these black spines on them. These next few species are very easily confused with the Kamehameha butterfly. And sometimes even entomologists have trouble telling these, these species apart. So the Kamehameha butterfly is in the genus Vanessa. And we actually have three non-native species of Vanessa that have become established in Hawaii. So the first two of those are shown here, um, and they're uh, types of painted ladies. So Vanessa cardui and Vanessa virginiensis are both similar in size to the Kamehameha butterfly and have very sing similar wing patterns, um, especially on the, the upper side of the wings. They do tend to be a little more light orange than the Kamehameha butterfly. But the, the key difference that you'll want to look for is in the, the black area near the tip of the forewing. So the non-native Vanessa species have a couple of additional white spots in this area uh, compared to the Kamehameha butterfly. Additionally, if you look at the underside of the wing, the painted ladies have distinct eye spots along the trailing edge of the, of the hind wing, while the Kamehameha butterfly lacks these eye spots. Painted lady butterflies can be found in a pretty broad range of habitats in Hawaii, and they can often become quite abundant in dry areas after periods of heavy rain because their caterpillars feed on a variety of weeds uh, when we get heavy rains, sometimes there's a, an abundance of these weeds, and so the, the painted lady populations can increase as well. The third species of non-native Vanessa established in Hawaii is the Red Admiral, Vanessa atalanta. This species is really similar to the Kamehameha butterfly, both in its appearance and also in its behavior. Its caterpillars feed on the same host plants as the Kamehameha butterfly, and adult Red Admirals also feed on tree sap, just like the Kamehameha butterfly. This all makes sense because uh, phylogenetic studies suggest that the Red Admiral is actually the closest relative to the Kamehameha butterfly outside of Hawaii. Um, so the two species share 
a fairly recent common ancestor. Um, with its wings open, the Red Admiral can be pretty easily distinguished from the Kamehameha butterfly by looking at the darker area closest to its body. Um, so it's, it's more of a, a deep brown color than the, um, the Kamehameha butterfly has. Um, the, the forewings also have that distinct orange band on the wings. And the, the other difference is if you, again, if you look in that black area near the tip of the forewings, like the other two non-native Vanessa, the Red Admiral also has these extra um, small white spots in that part of the wing. However, when the wings are folded up, uh, it, it is really difficult to tell the difference between the Red Admiral and the Kamehameha butterfly, especially considering that the wing patterns on both of these species are somewhat variable. So in order to, to really reliably tell them apart, it's good to have a view of that upper surface of the wing. Um, although the caterpillars of the Red Admiral do feed on mamaki and, and the other host plants that the Kamehameha butterfly utilizes, um, they're darker than the caterpillars of the Kamehameha butterfly, and they tend to be more fuzzy. They, they have a more, um, they have denser hairs covering their bodies. In Hawaii, the red admiral is only common on Hawaii Island um, and is less common on Maui, and it's actually uh, not established on any of the other islands to our knowledge. Here we'll shift focus a bit to talk about our other native species of butterfly, the Hawaiian blue or koa butterfly, Udara blackburni. This butterfly is in the family Lycenidae, which includes the blues, coppers, and hair streaks. The Hawaiian blue is much smaller than the Kamehameha butterfly with the wingspan of only about an inch. The underside of the wings is typically a metallic green, um, which you can see in the photo on the left, uh, while the upper side of the wings, which you can only see when they have their wings open, is an iridescent blue, um, which is where it gets the name the Hawaiian blue. The, the Hawaiian blue has a broader geographic range than the Kamehameha butterfly being found in wet and dry habitats on all of the main Hawaiian islands, and this includes Kaho'olawe. As such, it is probably more likely to colonize residential areas than is the Kamehameha butterfly, and so it might be a more realistic target when you're trying to attract native butterflies to your garden. For instance, on Oahu, it is still found near some of the, the fairly urban areas um, such as the, the back of Manoa Valley um, and also Coco Crater. The Hawaiian blue is somewhat less picky than the Kamehameha butterfly in terms of host plants. Um, the primary caterpillar host plants for the Hawaiian blue are koa and aali'i. Um, and these two plants are not closely re related to each other. Um, so the, the butterfly is able to utilize um, these two completely unrelated plants. It also occasionally uses mamaki as a larval host plant, and it may also be able to use even some non-native non -native trees, such as some of the introduced acacias. Caterpillars of the Hawaiian blue, like other species in the family Lycenidae, are small and pretty inconspicuous, and they keep their head and legs kind of tucked underneath their body making them appear somewhat slug-like. The caterpillars of the Hawaiian blue can be very difficult to spot. They're very well camouflaged and their, their feeding doesn't produce a distinctive type of damage um, that's different from other leaf feeding insects. Um, so they are very difficult to locate on the plant. This caterpillar here is, is feeding on the juvenile foliage of koa and you can see that it blends in very well with, with the leaflets. Male and female Hawaiian blue butterflies look really similar in appearance and they can't be easily distinguished from one another based on their, their coloration or wing pattern. Um, the Hawaiian blue has a very erratic flight pattern. So it kind of flits 
um, from plant to plant and zigzags around as it flies. Hawaiian blue butterflies are frequent visitors to both native and non-native flowers, so they're potentially very important pollinators of some of our native plants. A good way to see this species in the wild is to focus on searching flowers such as ko'o ko'olau, uh, koa flowers, um, or the um, flowers such as the iliahi or sandalwood seen here in this photo. Because the Hawaiian blue is so small, it's easily overlooked and it's also easily confused with some of our non-native blues, especially when you just see it flying by. We have at least five species of Lysenidae that are non-native in Hawaii but have been established, uh, but none of the non-native species have the green underside like the Hawaiian blue. I'm going to go over three of these non-native blues, which are commonly confused with the Hawaiian blue. The bean butterfly, or pea blue, Lampedes boeticus, is probably the most common Lysenid in Hawaii, and you're likely to encounter it in your garden. Its caterpillars feed on plants in the bean family, particularly rattlepod or crotillaria, which is a weed with a uh, bright yellow flower. The bean butterfly tends to be larger than the Hawaiian blue, so that's one way to tell it apart. Um, but of course, the, the main way is that the underside of the wings is not green. The bean butterfly also has two distinct eye spots on both the upper and the lower surface of the hind wings towards the trailing edge. Um, and they also have these short little tails extending backwards from the wings, although, although they, these may be difficult to see, and in fact, often they have broken off of the wings. The second of the lookalike blues is the Western Pygmy Blue, Brophidium exilis. This is the smallest butterfly in North America and is actually one of the smallest butterflies in the world. So it's not only smaller than the Hawaiian blue, but it has a gray or tan underside with very distinct black spots uh, along the trailing edge. And these are present on both the upper surface and the lower surface of the wings. Caterpillars of this species feed on Kenopodium and other plants in the goosefoot family. The third species of non-native blue that I'll talk about is the lesser grass blue, Zizina otis. Um, this is another very small butterfly that was recently established in Hawaii. The upper side of the wings does look very similar to the Hawaiian blue, although the, the lesser grass blue tends to have uh, a dark border around the blue color. Um, so it's bordered with dark gray most, most of the time. However, if you look at the underside, uh, the two butterflies look very different again. Um, so the underside of the lesser grass blue is light gray and has these obvious dark, dark black spots, uh, which the Hawaiian blue will never have. Caterpillars of the lesser grass blue feed on weeds in the bean family, especially ground covers uh, like sensitive, se sensitive plant, um, which is also called sleeping grass. So you often see this butterfly flying very close to the ground around its host plants. Now that you have a little more background about our native butterflies and know how to recognize them, it's time to talk about how to create habitat for them. Like most of our native insects, our native butterflies have lost a large part of their habitat, and we might be able to help expand their range by planting their host plants and protecting these plants from invasive predators. Of course, there's not a guarantee that by planting host plants, you'll, you'll attract native butterflies to your backyard. Um, but the more people that plant these host plants, the more likely it is that butterflies will begin to recognize residential areas as potential habitat. In general, areas closest to existing but butterfly habitat, such as native forests or native shrubland, are more likely to be recolonized by native butterflies when these host plants are restored. 
Just to recap, the most common host plant for the Kamehameha butterfly is Maumaki, Hipterus albidus. The most common host plants for the Hawaiian blue are Aali'i or Dodonea viscosa and Koa or Acacia Koa. So these are the plants that we're going to talk about in terms of propagation. Whenever you're propagating native plants, there are a few important things to keep in mind. The first is that you should try to keep it local. Different islands often have different varieties or genetic strains of the same species of plant, or they may even have different species in the same genus. Local varieties are more likely to be adapted to the climate and conditions in your area, so in general, those are the best varieties to use. If you're growing plants from seed, try to use a seed source as close as possible to your own location. You might want to contact conservation organizations in your area to see if they can provide seeds. Um, if you decide to buy plants from, from nurseries, first ask the growers where their stock came from. It might not be from the same island where you live. The second thing to keep in mind is that if you wish to collect your own seeds from the wild, you'll first need to obtain the proper permissions. Although none of the species I'm talking about today are endangered, you will need to, to get permission to collect seeds from wild populations if you're not the landowner. So for state lands such as forest reserves or natural area reserves, you'll want to contact the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources to request a permit. For private lands, you would contact the landowner to ask permission to collect seeds. For the Kamehameha butterfly, the easiest host plant to grow is mamaki. Mamaki is a fast-growing shrub or a small tree, and its leaves are used to make a healthy tea, so it's a great plant to have in your backyard. Mamaki grows naturally in areas with a lot of rainfall, and it's most common in gulches and along streams, so consider this when you're planting it and when you're selecting areas to plant it in. It does like a lot of water, but the soil should also have pretty good drainage. Maumaki prefers cool, sheltered locations, and it's best, it does best in windward and Malka parts of the island. So if you live someplace very hot and dry, you might want to focus your effort on plants for the Hawaiian blue rather than the Kamehameha butterfly, especially since those types of areas are unlikely to attract the Kamehameha butterfly um, because they they don't occur in very dry areas. Maumaki can be grown from seeds or cuttings, but I've had much better luck growing from seeds, so that's what I'm going to focus on here. Maumaki are usually dioecious, meaning that male and female flowers are in, on separate plants. So you have male plants and you have female plants. If you'd like to eventually use your plants to grow more plants from seed, um, not only will you need to have female plants to produce the seed, but you'll also have to make sure that you have male plants to pollinate the female plants. Um, so make sure to plant several individuals so that you have a better chance of having both male and female plants uh, within a reasonable distance of each other. Uh, Mamaki flowers are wind pollinated, so uh, pollen needs to blow from the male plant to the female plant. Um, and then the, the pictures on the the picture on the left shows female flowers, and the picture on the right shows male flowers. So you can see on the male flowers they have these little anthers, um, little kind of round anthers that stick out from the the flowers, whereas the female plants are covered in. Uh, stigma uh, that uh, receive the pollen from the male flowers. After they're pollinated, mamaki fruits are ripe when they've turned white and the fruit has softened. Within each fruit will be many tiny seeds. To harvest that seed, collect the fruits when they're white and soft and keep them in a sealed plastic bag until they become very soft and mushy. This might take a few days. Then put the fruit through a very fine strainer to remove the pulp. These fine tea strainers are sometimes available at local stores. Wash as much of the pulp out as you can, then invert the strainer onto a paper towel 
and spread the seeds out to dry at room temperature. Once they're dried, the seeds can be put into a plastic bag and stored in the refrigerator for over a year. To germinate the seeds, just sprinkle them onto a flat of soil using a mixture that provides good drainage. So we use three parts perlite to one part peat mix, but you can also use fine cinder instead of the perlite. Keep the flats really well watered so that the soil doesn't dry out. We keep ours in a shade house with an automatic misting system, and the seeds usually germinate within two weeks, at which point we um, foliar feed the seedlings by spraying them with a dilute liquid fertilizer. This will help speed up the growth during this early stage. Once the seedlings have four to six true leaves in addition to the cotyledons, you can carefully transplant them into individual pots uh, before their root systems become too entangled with each other in the flat. Um, the seedlings in this photo are, are pro were probably too densely planted, so we probably sprinkled too many seeds close together. Um, so in, in this case, it might be difficult to remove the seedlings uh, without damaging the root systems. So be conscious of that when you're sowing your seeds. Um, once the plants become established in pots, mamaki will grow very quickly if, if you keep it well fertilized and watered. Uh, and then the plants can be put into the ground when they're one to three feet tall. Um, and we try to transplant our plants during the winter months um, or during rainy periods uh, so that they're not uh, shocked by, by dry weather or, or drought. For the Hawaiian blue, Aali'i is probably the most appropriate plant for most homeowners to plant in their backyard because it remains a pretty small shrub. It's a versatile, fast-growing plant that thrives in a wide range of conditions from both hot and dry to cool and rainy. It can be shaped into a hedge and it has these attractive seed pods that can be used in flower arrangements or to make hakule. Um, and Aali'i does best in locations that have both good drainage and full sun. As with mamaki, Aali'i also tends to be dioecious with male and female flowers on separate individual plants. So you'll either have a male plant or a female plant. The male flowers have bunches of anthers while the female flowers are initially pretty inconspicuous, um, but they eventually develop into uh, winged seed pods. As with mamaki, if you, if you intend to eventually harvest seed from your plants, make sure to plant several individuals so that you have a better chance of having both a male and a female plant near each other. Aali'i are easily grown from seed as long as that seed has been fertilized. Um, the, the seeds tend to have pretty good germination rates. To harvest the seeds, you'll wait until the, the seed pods have dried and turned brown on the plant, and the seeds inside should be hard and black. If the seeds are still white or even light brown, the, the pods aren't quite ripe yet. So you wanna wait until those pods um, are dried and turned brown. To remove the seeds, you just crush up the seed pods um, and then kind of uh, separate out the seeds from the, the uh, pod material. And if you're not going to plant them immediately, you can actually just store them in a cool area in a paper bag um, until you're ready to plant them. To germinate the seeds, you'll first soak them in, in water overnight in a sh shallow dish of water. And then the next day, you'll plant individual seeds in small pots or in a divided tray. So in this case, you want to plant probably just one seed per pot because they have fairly good uh, germination rate and it's a much larger seed than the mamaki seed. You're going to want to use a soil mix with good drainage, so similar to the soil that we used for mamaki. 
uh, with um, a heavy, heavy ratio of perlite or cinder to peat. You can also mix in a slow release fer fertilizer into the soil be be before you plant. Um, again, these seeds should be watered daily and the viable seeds should sprout within about a month. You can repot them as needed, but you'll want to wait until plants are at least about six inches tall before you put them into the ground. The other important host plant for the Hawaiian blue is koa. Um, but since koa is a large tree with an extensive root system and it's vulnerable to diseases at low elevations, it's unlikely to be a practical landscape tree for most homeowners in Hawaii. Um, but some gardeners will have the space and the conditions appropriate for koa. Um, but since there are other resources available um, besides this talk, I'm not going to talk much about propagation of this species here. Koa is really pretty easy to propagate from seed, um, and researchers have also been working towards developing disease resistant strains of koa, so that might be something to look into if you are uh, planning to plant koa in your backyard. Of course, creating habitat for butterflies is not just about providing the resources that the caterpillars need, but it's also about protecting them from predators when necessary. It is to be expected, even in a natural setting, that, that most caterpillars in a population will be eaten by predators. That's just kind of the way it is. Predation is a natural phenomenon, especially for species like butterflies that may lay hundreds of eggs. Uh, most of those eggs are not gonna make it to adulthood. However, in Hawaii, ecosystems are unbalanced because we've been invaded by many non-native predators. So native caterpillars are particularly vulnerable to these non-native predators, especially things like ants. Hawaii has no native ants and our fauna haven't evolved defenses against them. So many of our native insects are really vulnerable to non-native ants. In order to create viable habitat, it might be necessary to control ants around the butterfly host plants. There are many options for ant control, and these include chemical methods of control, such as insecticidal baits. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because there are so many different baits out there, and different baits are appropriate for different species of ants. But insecticidal ant baits can often be safely applied to the ground without threatening native butterflies, caterpillars, or other pollinators. However, for the, those baits to be effective against ants, you must first correctly identify those ants. Different ants prefer different types of baits, and if you apply the wrong bait, it's just going to be completely ineffective. Um, if you are concerned about effects on other insects, including other species or, or beneficial species, you might consider using bait stations, which might reduce the impact on other insects because it decreases the chance, chances that other insects will come in contact with the bait. Another option for control of ants around your host plants are sticky barriers applied to the trunks of the host plants. This is a non-toxic alternative to chemical ant baits. We use a product called Tree Tanglefoot, which is produced from natural gums and resins. I wouldn't use this product on very young plants. I would wait until your tree has been in the ground for about a year or two and has more of a substantial trunk. First, you want to prune away any vegetation that is touching the branches of your host plant. So any other plants that are in the area, you're going to want to print them, prune them back so that there are no bridges that ants can use to bypass the sticky barrier. Then you're going to wrap a layer of rolled gauze tightly around the trunk. And you want to do this about six inches above the soil level. And what the gauze does is it provides a breathable protective layer um, on top of the bark. And then on top of that gauze, what we do is we wrap horticultural tape or flagging tape tightly around the gauze and then tie it 
and we applied the, the Tanglefoot product in a thin strip around that flagging tape. So basically the Tanglefoot does not come in direct contact with the trunk, but it prevents access um, of the trunk by ants. Um, you're going to want to check that that sticky barrier pretty regu regularly to make sure that it hasn't been covered by debris or dust, which can create bridges over the barrier. Um, and you also want to remove and replace the gauze and the, the tape every four to six months because you, you don't want your plant to become girdled. Um, you don't want to restrict the growth of the tree. Now you have the basic tools to create habitat for our native pulelehua. If you do end up successfully attracting either species of butterfly, or if you come across the butterflies or caterpillars in the wild, we would really love to hear about it. Uh, we track native butterfly sightings using a, a citizen science program called iNaturalist. Uh, this is an app that you can add onto your phone, and what you can do is take a picture of the butterfly or caterpillar and upload it to iNaturalist and uh, once it's tagged with the correct species ID uh, we would be notified that there's a new observation of one of our native pulelehua. Um, so if you do come across them um, go ahead and submit those observations. It would be really helpful to know um, especially if you're able to attract them into areas where you haven't seen them before. Thank you so much for your interest in our native pollinators and our native butterflies. If you'd like any more information on what we do at the Hawaii Invertebrate Program, or if you have any questions about the material in this presentation, uh, feel free to follow us on social media or shoot me an email at the address on the screen. Thanks again, and good luck with the butterfly gardening.